So Jim Greenacre, who was a crew member there in 1937, recorded in his journal that there was a day that Dr. Roberts left camp. He left the boys alone at camp to work, which they did not. They went into the pits and they picked up clods of dirt. Remember, this is the 30s, it's pretty dry. And they began throwing them at each other and having a dirt clod war, throwing these things at one another. And Jim Greenacre did record this in his journal, which his wife Doris later read, which she then went to Bob Easterday, another crew member, and asked him about his memories of that event. And he was horrified and said, we would have never behaved so outrageously. <laughs> so this morning when Dr. Frizen was talking, he mentioned a handful of things. He mentioned that Dr. Roberts visited up in Wyoming uh, with his brother. Uh, was it Agate Basin site? And I recall reading in Jim Greenacre's journal that Dr. Roberts' brother actually came to camp one season uh, after the cook had fallen off a curb in Fort Collins and broken his ankle and couldn't cook anymore at the site. Um, so Dr. Roberts' brother came in and Jim Greenacre recorded that he really wished that the doctor's brother had been cooking all summer long because the food was much better. Now the cook prior to this was a young man named Noah, Noah Herbert. And Doris Greenacre knew him. She had been at high school with him. And when Jim told her that Noah Herbert was going to be their cook, I'm going to do what she did, she said, oh, Lordy, they're never going to survive that. <laughs> so it, it was a blessing to have a replacement cook. We are ready, I think, to start with our first speaker of the afternoon. She is the supervising curator for the Anasazi Heritage Center. She has a long relationship, I would say friendship, with the Fort Collins Museum. As a graduate student at Colorado State University, she did her thesis studying the collections um, at the Fort Collins Museum, the artifacts, lithic artifacts from Lindenmeyer that were donated by the Coffin family. Bridget Ambler, is our speaker for the afternoon, first speaker for the afternoon. And I first met her the same weekend I first met Dr. Jodry. I already knew Dennis from my internship at Natural History, but I had not met Peggy yet. I had heard a lot about her. And we got to go down into the basement um, at the Fort Collins Museum, which was in the old Carnegie Library at the time. We were in this little room. Um, we had a uh, documentary filmmaker with us, Peggy Dennis, Bridget, and Bridget was there with her little daughter, who's I think 18 months old at the time, and very impactful for me. I remember Peggy saying, oh, we need more of these young women archaeologists doing the science and having their families because you can. Um, that just really impacted me as to Peggy's frame of mind and also the kind of woman Bridget is to um, being able to have a family and do her research. So without further ado, Bridget Ambler. I just want to first of all say how incredibly humbled I am to be here. We are all so lucky to be in the midst of George Frizen. And then I just met Dr. Wilm Wilmson, um, whose work I'm intimately familiar with from graduate school. And um, I, I felt like I got to know you through your writings, but it's a pleasure to meet you in person. And just the other great minds that are here at this symposium. Now, I would like to do a couple of things today. First of all, I'd like to share with you all my graduate research, which took place about 20 years ago here at the Colorado State University. And I, while I did not rewrite Plains Prehistory with my master's thesis, nonetheless, I do believe that it was a contribution um, and one that all of us, the role of science and the role that students play in science to explore and even get poked at and to learn from is so critical as we move along. And secondly, I do want to also explore a little bit about the role museum collections play in scholarly inquiry. 
So um, my graduate research was at CSU. At the time, my, grad, uh, my advisor, Jeff Amy, said, hey, you know, I heard that the Fort Collins Museum has these Folsom artifacts in the basement. I was a lithics geek. I wanted to have a graduate project looking at rocks. And um, they really had not been systematically cataloged. Um, they really were in a dusty old basement, but they, but they knew where they were. And so I went down there to start analyzing. Um, graciously, the Fort Collins Museum at the time let me work with the collections. So one of the very first things that struck me about working with this collection is the enormous contribution that the Coffin family played um, in the discovery of Lindenmeyer. The collection I was working with was entirely donated to the museum, was entirely that collected by the Coffin family and later donated to the museum. Um, here's Judge Claude Coffin. There you can see Claude and Roy at Lindenmeyer. Um, and here we have, this is actually on an excellent blog spot called Lin the Lindenmeyer site, produced by a CSU student. And um, I believe that, while they're not identified, I believe that's Judge Claude on the left and Major Roy on the right. And um, Ed Lohr, in his, um, in his notes about this, said, this is the way not to do archaeology. These guys are there ratting around. And one point I would like to make about the coffins is that, first of all, Roy was a geologist, so he did have a sense of ge geographic superimposition. He knew that, that the rules of superimposition. And secondly, they were tireless in making sure that the people who mattered knew about the site. They knew that the site was special. They knew that the artifacts that they were finding were special, especially after the Folsom find. And they worked really hard to make sure that uh, folks from the Smithsonian came out to investigate the site. So regardless of their field methodology and um, the, the problems that it might impose on us later on, they're to be given a lot of credit for recognizing what they had found. Now, in this picture, you can contrast the excavation techniques that the Smithsonian used with uh, strict horizontal and vertical uh, control measures to be able to document the materials that they found with those employed by the coffins. This also proved to be a challenge in conducting the artifact analysis with the coffin collection. Um, for example, we know the coffins collected a lot of projectile points, and in fact, in the booklet that was handed out in the back table, um, it references 34 projectile points found by the coffin brothers. I never found that many in the analysis, so I'm pretty sure that perhaps the best artifacts were retained into the private collection of the Coffin family. And I was following Wilmson's analytical analysis of the Smithsonian Institution collections, and it was very difficult to try to mirror those results knowing that my sample was already skewed. Here's the Lindenmeyer site. That's an early uh, picture from the Smithsonian reports by Ed Lohr. Uh, most of you are familiar with Lindenmeyer up at the top of the map there, right on the border of uh, Wyoming. Are, have any of you not been to the Lindenmeyer vicinity? Okay, it's a beautiful valley. Um, dissected by, uh, by some streams and, um, and riparian areas. It's just incredible, bordering on the plains. So what I decided to do was uh, to analyze these artifacts. What I really wanted to know is where were folks at Lindenmeyer getting their raw materials? And in order to figure that out, I wanted to use ultraviolet fluorescence. Now, my results were not this dramatic, but I think it makes a pretty picture. Um, and to do that, I chose some source materials from this 
area from the plains that were known to be uh, frequent Folsom sources. And I studied a technique under Jack Hoffman at the University of Canvas, Kansas doing high wave and low wave ultraviolet fluorescence and comparing those, uh, those results with known sources. So the lithic analysis, again, Dr. Wilmson, you might recognize this graph. Um, I adapted my lithic analysis ba based on Dr. Wilmson's research. And here you can just see some of those landmarks that Wilmson used that I later adopted in my own research. In addition, I also used Dr. Wilmson's artifact categories, but expanded them on them a bit uh, to suit my own purposes. So uh, this is a list of the artifact categories that were used uh, in my analysis. What I did find is that expedient tools were really underrepresented in the coffin collection. And that shouldn't be surprising. The, the coffins were collectors. And again, they were usually going after projectile points or formal tools. And I think that the reason is that debitage and expedient tools is, are underrepresented is that they were probably tossed after they were removed and they were keeping the best for the collection. There were some projectile points found, of course. Um, now, I mentioned that the pamphlet mentioned that uh, 34 points were found. I was able to identify 20 projectile points in the coffin collection at the Fort Collins Museum. Um, this is about half the frequency that their presence in the coffin collection is about half the frequency that Dr. Wilmson found at the Smithsonian. And again, I think part of that might be because a number of those projectile points, um, perhaps the best, were retained by the coffin family. Uh, the spurred end scrapers were ubiquitous, and Jack Hoffman swears that these are almost as diagnostic of Folsom sites as the projectile points themselves. And those are really common at Folsom assemblages and very common in this collection. So the guiding questions I wanted to ask were, could the materials from the coffin collection be traced to their source? And if so, what do those materials distributions tell us about Folsom mobility patterns? And then finally, how does this assemblage compare to that at the Smithsonian, and what does that tell us about collector behavior? So here is a graph of my um, antiquated thesis showing you uh, the material frequencies I found in my research. The majority of the materials were heart fill uplift. You heard Dr. Frizen talking about that earlier today. Uh, it's a Wyoming source. Also flat top chalcedony, further to northeastern Colorado, and a lot of unidentified chert. And after hearing a couple of the talks this morning, I wonder if those might actually be, as Cody inferred, some of the local, um, local cherts. These are the known lithic sources that I tested against that were, are represented at Lindenmeyer. And here are some examples of what those sources look like. Uh, this, for example, is a projectile point, a Folsom projectile point of Hartville materials. It's a replica, but just to let you know, uh, Hartville is incredible incredibly diverse, and I was talking to Bob Patton about this yesterday. It occurs in all sorts of uh, morphological styles and has some very quartzitic varieties, and so it's, it's a hard material to definitely place, which is why I was using the ultraviolet uh, technique. We also had compared against Alabates Flit from the Texas Panhandle. It was represented at the Linnenmeyer site. It's also variable, but it has this characteristic purple and white banding that is um, really beautiful. Next, we had a lot of flat top chalcedony from northeastern Colorado. Flat top can be highly variable as well, but it fluoresces fairly consistently. And then Edwards Chert from Central Texas, which are very, this source is very common to Folsom sites throughout the uh, planes uh, occurred at Lindenmeyer in limited frequencies. So I wanted to look at 
You know, how would we know if people are acquiring these sources directly or whether they're trading for them? And I used models developed by Binford, Hoffman, and others. Um, and according to those models, these Folsom populations would be really low densities. You wouldn't see other groups very often. And so it would make dependence on trade really risky because you couldn't count on it. Um, the, where I was basing this on off of models where th these groups are moving across a large landscape and moving around a lot. And so it would require that you know where your sources are and you plan your movement according to where those sources are. So as you're following buffalo, bison out on the plains, you're going to deliberately make a trip uh, to this place. You might not have even been there. You might have heard about it from your grandfather, but you're going to go there because you know you have good sources there. Um, reliance on big game, especially bison, uh, really necessitated that you had a dependable toolkit. You couldn't be caught out on the plains facing a bison antiquus with your pants down, so to speak. So you had to be able to have a reliable toolkit. And an indicator of trade would be that we find all sorts of different material types um, from all over the place. So conclusions from my research uh, with the coffin collections, based on the material frequencies that we found um, in this particular case, were that the Lindenmeyer occupants had a curative technology. That is, they were holding on to materials for a long period of time. Those materials traveled for hundreds of miles with the occupants of Lindenmeyer by the time they got there. They transported those materials to the site. Um, and importantly, the site was extensively used and reused. Uh, we heard uh, Dr. LaBelle talked about this, Dr. Frizen that Lindenmeyer is a special place that people are coming back to again and again and again, all the way through late prehistoric times, as a matter of fact. Interestingly, at Lindenmeyer, folks are hanging around there longer, and there are multiple foods represented there, including turtles and jackrabbits. Um, so folks were hanging around there longer than they did at other places. The site has a very diverse artifact assemblage. We don't see as much of that in the coffin collection as we do at the collections from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and at the Smithsonian Institution, but from those assemblages, we know they're there. And um, the, the artifact distribution tells us something about collector behavior as well. We know that the artifacts represented in the coffin collection do not, um, their frequencies are not the same as those of the Smithsonian. And it made me really interested to hear uh, about the Denver Museum of Nature and Science collections and how those also differ from the Smithsonian's. And I think that that is a question worthy of additional research. At the end of the day, uh, what my research as a young graduate student told me, taught me, was that Lindenmeyer is really a special place. Um, now, in talking with Dr. Jodry, Dr. Jodry and Dr. Stanford were both mentors of mine as I was doing my graduate research. I am not sure that Lindenmeyer is the only campsite like it. I'm guessing that there are other campsites like this up and down the Front Range, which served as a virtual highway, if you will. There are crow stories about using the Front Range to travel down into Mexico. However, it's the only site with that kind of longevity and density that we're aware of now, and that's part of what makes it so special. Wilmson argues, and I have to agree, that perhaps there are different groups occupying Lindenmeyer, coming together perhaps seasonally, convening, trading materials, marrying, making arrangements for the future, forming communal bonds. I think that that is a viable hypothesis, um, and perhaps why it was occupied for so many years in a row, repeatedly. Um, and Dr. Jodry also pointed out when we went to Lindenmeyer, there's a very noticeable white strata there. 
You're living as part of a community based on oral tradition where your very life depends on knowing where your resources are and having a great mental map of your surroundings. Lindenmeyer would have been a recognizable place on the landscape that you could go back to convene year after year. So this leads me to the next uh, portion that I want to conclude with is, you know, I learned so much from Lindenmeyer as a graduate student and it taught me a lot. And it, what it led me to also explore was the role of museum institutions in terms of raising the next generation of archaeologists, advancing scholarship, and engaging with our communities. So what does the Lindenmeyer collection mean to Fort Collins? Here you can see artifacts from the Lindenmeyer site that now are stored very differently than when I first encountered them some 25 years ago. They are carefully put away and cataloged, and if you haven't had a chance to go to the museum, please do, because they have so many of them out on full display where you can actually get up close with the real deal and see those artifacts for yourself. Archaeology is a destructive science. Much of what we do is destroyed. Much of the evidence is destroyed from the moment that we excavate those remains. We can never go back and replicate the Smithsonian excavations. But what we can do is go to museums, like the one in Fort Collins, like the Smithsonian, to access the artifacts and to um, advance our inquiry. As technology changes, surely our questions about the past will change as well. And we can turn to these collections as a source for those inquiries. Collections like this have educational value. Um, studies have shown that people go to museums because they want to experience something real. And collections, including archives and photographs and artifacts and structures, they help give our community a sense of identity in place. These are powerful tools for conveying the past. And they help visitors and the public understand some of these complex relationships. Collections also have research value, as I indicated before. We preserve collections for future research. Collections are here for all of you, for the American public. For example, um, Crow Canyon Archaeological Center, down where I live in Dolores, is testing ancient corn varieties and uh, uh, testing the ancient DNA. As we're living in a hotter and drier world, maybe some of those earlier corn samples can actually provide some uh, answers for us for growing corn in an arid climate. Collections tell important stories about our communities. You've heard Trelor talking about the Smithsonian um, tales, and I had the distinct honor to spend some lovely afternoons with Mr. Easterday, and those stories are a part of the fabric that makes Fort Collins special. They're a part of the fabric that makes this museum special, and it's something that each and every one of you own just a little bit of. Through our collections, we can develop exhibits and tell stories that are powerful and intimate. Um, you know, in 2011, the American Association of Museums sponsored a survey, a national survey, and, and later um, the Institute of Library Science sponsored an additional survey, and those surveys revealed that what pe people learn in museums, they trust museum sources more than almost any other source of information they receive. So be mindful, because if you go to uh, certain museums, <laughs> you, you might be getting a story that is uh, slanted, but the American public sees museums as conveying factual and accurate information. When we use our, mu when you, we use our museum collections to tell those stories, it really has the power to impact communities. And I am so impressed by the job that the Fort Collins Museum of Discovery has done with its Lyndon Meyer collection. And you know, as a person who's also been an exhibit developer and been to museums all over the United States, um, you really have a gem here in the story that you're telling and the way you're conveying it. So museums and museum collections can transcend the dusty basements, and they have the powerful 
or the power to engage in community partnerships in a dialogue that has deep meaning for your community. Behind the scenes, it's, the, it's a place where the past is being carefully kept alive for future generations and where each of you has a voice in its telling. Thank you.